Good evening. Bonjour et bonsoir à toutes et à tous. And Kiora Koto. My name is Christine Nakamura, Vice President of the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada in Toronto. Naomai, Haidamai. Bienvenue and welcome to day two of the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada's first Canadian women only virtual business mission to Australia and New Zealand. And to those who attended day one, welcome back. It's my pleasure to be your host and MC tonight. But before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that while we are all meeting in a global digital space, the places Canadians call home are the traditional territories of many First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples. Tonight, we are hosting you once again from Toronto on the traditional territory of many nations, uh, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Now I, I'm going to go over a few housekeeping uh, matters. The webinar is again being recorded and will be posted on our website shortly after the mission. To access the event brochure, which includes the full agenda, speaker biographies, and directory of all of our wonderful delegates, please click on the cloud button uh, with the arrow to the extreme right of your screen, just underneath the um, chat button with the three little dots to download your e-brochure. Please post your questions in the chat box. And I see there's lots of action going on in the chat box already on the right side of your screen. Time permitting, we'll do our best to respond to all the questions. Audio interpretation is being provided by Interactio. To access French language interpretation, please visit the link in the chat box, app.interactio.io in a new browser and use the code in capital letters, APF Canada. And if you run into any technical difficulties in English or French, uh, please contact events at asiapacific.ca. Our session today will conclude at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time here in Toronto, 1 p.m. in Australia EDT, and 3 p.m. in New Zealand DT. Those who joined us yesterday, I hope you felt that the program was helpful and exciting. It certainly excited and inspired me. The expert panel shared valuable insights and advice which will benefit aspiring entrepreneurs. Tonight, we have another inspiring program which includes a discussion with an exceptional panel of successful Indigenous women entrepreneurs representing Australia, Canada, and New Zealand who are rewriting the narrative to ensure inclusive economic growth for our three economies. Following the panel, there'll be a pit session by our delegates on their innovative products and services and a moderated Q&A afterwards. But before we go on, I'd like to give go back and give a bit of uh, background for those who weren't with us last night. Uh, and I know that we have a number of guests uh, joining us for the first time. So I appreciate the patience of those who were with us last night. This is the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada's fourth women only business mission to the Asia Pacific region and Oceania. Following successes of three earlier missions, first in 2019 to Japan in person, the second, which was the first Canadian virtual mission dedicated to women entrepreneurs to South Korea in 2020, and the third to Taiwan in March, 2021, which followed a hybrid model with Canadians attending virtually and our Taiwanese friends assembling in a large convention hall in Taipei. We're still monitoring outcomes from our missions, and I'm really happy to see that positive results are on the rise with a number of negotiations still ongoing. Business partnerships in the Asia Pacific region don't usually emerge overnight, and we have to be patient. Our relationships take time to nurture, but when trust and respect are developed, lasting partnerships will be established, resulting in mutually beneficial outcomes economically speaking. I mentioned yesterday that in addition to the business uh, successes from our trade missions, a powerful network of women leaders and entrepreneurs in Canada and abroad is forming 
and which continues to expand with every uh, mission that we host. CANWIN, or the Canadian Women's International Network, which the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada launched earlier this year in May, is connecting Canadian and international women leaders, entrepreneurs, and gender equality advocates, creating an ecosystem to advance the feminist agenda and economic empowerment for women in business. Canwin welcomes international women business leaders and entrepreneurs from, the, from Asia and Oceania to work with us in minimizing barriers disproportionately affecting women entrepreneurs with the aim of facilitating the achievement of their real, real and full potential. If you're interested in joining Canwin, please register your interest on our website at www.asiapacific.ca slash networks slash canwin. And it'll be posted later on on the chat screen. And tonight, we are privileged to have Canwin's inaugural chair and Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada's board member, Dr. Lois Nahirni, to welcome everyone tonight. So with no further ado, Lois, please take the mic. Wonderful. Christine, thank you so much for that kind introduction and for leading this very exciting initiative. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Bonsoir et bonjour et bienvenue à toutes et à tous. Tena koto katar, now my harimai. It gives me great pleasure to welcome our delegates and guests from Canada, Australia, and Aotearoa, New Zealand, to the second day of this groundbreaking two-day virtual women's mission. This mission encourages cooperation between and among Canada, Australia, and Aotearoa, New Zealand, and is supporting Canadian women entrepreneurs by facilitating opportunities to access growth markets in the Asia Pacific region. It's also enabling dialogue on gender equity and women's empowerment to help move the dial forward for women, Indigenous and non-Indigenous alike, in Canada, Australia, and Aotearoa, New Zealand. Our delegation highlights Canada's cultural diversity and includes women thought leaders and inspiring women entrepreneurs who represent Canada's best and brightest in business in a range of fields, including STEM. The mission delegates have been carefully chosen for their innovative technologies, products, and services in the areas of infrastructure, smart cities, sustainable solutions, and health technology. And I cannot wait to hear about more of these in the breakout today. The mission is also a wonderful opportunity to invite women from our three countries to join the Asia Pacific Foundation's Canadian Women's International Network, as Christine talked about. And I am very proud to be the inaugural chair, and I personally extend this invitation to you. Canwin is an international ecosystem of women, assisting Canadian women in international business by creating powerful connections, advocacy, and support with the women like you on this call. The network connects thought leaders, entrepreneurs, and gender equality organizations to advance gender equity and empower Canadian women in the dynamic markets of the Asia Pacific. So please look for it in the chat and I invite you to join. In today's discussions, we're looking forward to a fantastic panel and we're gonna share perspectives on indigenous economies, discuss the frequently under and or unrecognized value of these economies and address the opportunities and barriers for indigenous women led companies to scale internationally and access global markets. And that precedes the central business to business component of our mission in which our talented Canadian delegates are gonna be pitching their businesses to, inter uh, to interested potential Australian and New Zealand partners, many of you with us right now. So yesterday and today would not have been possible without the amazing efforts of the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada led by Christine Nakamura and her team, a huge thanks to get to them. Together, they've uh, organized this exciting and innovative mission, which we know will result in new partnerships. In addition, our thanks to the Government of Canada, mission partners, and our supporters in Canada, Australia, and Aotearoa, New Zealand, for investing in this worthy and progressive initiative. On a personal note, I am so thrilled to be involved in a Canadian mission to this part of the world that I fell in love with many, many years ago as a student at the University of Auckland. Honestly, my heart is just so a part of 
Auckland, uh, New Zealand. And uh, I backpacked both countries for many months and have had lots of business over the years in both of the countries. It's so good to be back, even if only virtually. I'm delighted to be with you. So thank you. Merci. Kia ora koto kato. I'm so happy to be here with you today. Thanks. Always for those warm words of welcome and your continued support to the foundation's work on advancing women's economic empowerment. We really, really do appreciate your support, Lois. I now invite Ms. Raylene Whitford, founder of IndigiX and a proud Métis whose current passion is to encourage through her platform, collaboration among Indigenous professionals around the world to power inclusive economic growth through international trade. Raylene will introduce the panel on Ind Indigenous women's trade opportunities and moderate the discussion following remarks from each panelist. Biographies of all of our speakers tonight are in the e-brochure that I mentioned earlier, so please download it if you haven't done it done so already. So Raylene, with no further ado, over to you. Thank you, Christine. Tansi Kaya Nita Tamtik Amirusin Ameskana Notes, Raylene Whitford Nitsiga So. Uh, welcome everybody. My name is Raylene Whitford. I'm Cree Métis, originally from Alberta. I'm joining you from the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh territory in what is now known as Canada. And it is a true pleasure to moderate the panel of amazing Indigenous entrepreneurs today. So just to reiterate what Lois um, highlighted. So the objectives of the panel are to share perspectives on Indigenous economies, address opportunities and barriers for Indigenous women-led women -led companies, share experiences in founding these companies and to build trilateral relationships among Indigenous and non-Indigenous businesswomen around the world. So to introduce, um, I'm going to allow the panelists to introduce themselves because really I couldn't do their backgrounds justice. Um, but our first panelist is from Turtle Island, which is now known as Canada, Carol Ann Hilton, the founder of the Global Centre of Indigenomics. Our second panelist is from Australia, Cheryl Bailey, the founder of Indigenous Technology from Australia. We have Jen Harper, who is also from uh, Canada, the founder and CEO of Cheekbone Beauty Cosmetics. And we have from Aotearoa, Kiri Nathan, the founder of Kiri Nathan Limited. So welcome, ladies. It's a pleasure to see you all. Awesome. So I, as I said, I wouldn't be able to do your backgrounds justice. So maybe Caroline, if we can start from you, uh, with you, can you tell us a, a bit about yourself, your journey, what Indigenomics is for our attendees today? For sure, thank you. Thank you so much. You're able to hear me? We are. Good. Uklasish Caroline Hilton, Heshkwayak Supsish Uklas Wakatush Koatsa Omti. I am New Channel from the west coast of Vancouver Island. I come from a whaling tradition, a potlatch tradition, and our people have been successful in economy of how we express who we are for thousands and thousands of years. So this conversation today, thank you for the leadership of bringing it together, bringing these perspectives together, <clears throat> and really highlighting Indigenous voices in um, this emerging uh, indigenous economic strength and uptake that is happening globally. I am signing in from the Lekwungen territory in Victoria, BC today. Um, I wanted to preface that I am deeply inspired in my work by the courage and tenacity of indigenous entrepreneurs. It's really what drives me and in being inspired um, I think it's really important to bring that um, into our perspective of how much courage it takes to be an Indigenous entrepreneur. Um, in introducing uh, the work that I do, I have two friends. The first is uh, the Indigenomics Institute, which I um, work with on the national um, scene here in Canada, and I'm driving the billion dollar national indigenous economy. So essentially it was placing into Canadian identity to shift away from 
a perspective of solely seeing indigenous peoples on the cost side of the equation and moving towards seeing indigenous constructive generative economies and in that work really shaping and valuing um, this visibility of indigenous economic strength. Um, on the international side, I recently established the Global Center of Indigenomics. We'll be uh, founding a global indigenous virtual marketplace and describing market from the perspective of indigenous uh, worldview. I established essentially this concept of um, the indigenomics economic mix, which is 12 levers of indigenous economic design, those places to invest in increased indigenous economic activity and space for uh, building narratives around indigenous business success. In that the development of the World Indigenous Economic Forum will be central to the concept of indigenomics itself to bring the space, the leadership, and to build a platform that's essentially about modern constructive indigenous economic design. For some of us, it's been 150 plus years. For some of us, it's been 500 plus years of the experience of colonialism. So indigenomics is really a response to that economic isolation. Indigenomics is about revaluing Indigenous worldview of economy. It's about revaluing Indigenous economic intelligence and to place that in um, the context of the biggest questions of our lifetime as humanity itself. The concepts of uh, dignity, resilience, impact, responsibility, and generational wealth transfer to rehold the perspectives and the space for what that means from an Indigenous perspective is really what this concept of Indigenomics is doing. And I wanted to um, bring a perspective specifically to Indigenous trade and to um, my sisters in Australia, um, New Zealand, my sister Jen here in Canada, that this is a conversation of reawakening the neural networks of Indigenous prosperity. We know how to do this, and it's a remembering and reawakening our pathways of our relationships so that some of these go back thousands and thousands of years. So centering on this concept of Indigenous economic intelligence, it really um, intrigued me to come and be a part of this conversation today and to realize that this emerging visibility of Indigenous business, this re-shift in the narrative of talent and capacity, I really choose to see and view our people from a space of how talented we are, of how much capacity we have and how we respond and from our resilience. And that resilience is really based on thousands of years of our success and at the foundation of that is a value of love that really our response to now is based on ancestral strength and to see the uptake of business i think it's really a response to creating the space of who we are standing in our truth of who we are and expressing that through business so thank you so much for the opportunity to come and spend time with you today and i look forward everyone has to say thank you thank you caroline and that is why i didn't introduce the panelists i don't think that <laughs> i would have even been able to attempt to do that justice thank you for setting a wonderful tone um next we have cheryl bailey cheryl can you tell us about yourself can you tell us about indigenous technology share a little bit of your story with us Okay, thank you. Uh, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the traditional custodians of country. I'm on Gadigal country and I pay my respects to the Eora people uh, um, of the Eora Nation um, and I pay my respects to elders both past, present and emerging. So I'm in Sydney. Um, so a bit of background um, about my journey and then what led me into Indigenous technology. Um, so Indigenous tech, uh, my bit, uh, so I, I was uh, started in lived in the country, so which is about 500 k's north from Sydney. 
I moved to Sydney when I was 15 years of age um, on my own, put myself into an Aboriginal hostel. I wanted to continue and further my education um, um, at such a young age, <laughs> what I was thinking at 15, honestly, to go alone. But um, uh, from that journey uh, 16 years ago, I completed my Microsoft Certification Professional MCP. So it gave me a bit of an insight into IT 16 years ago. Um, I, then my journey uh, started at Qantas in the development side from um, pretty much growing through the company from ground up. Um, I actually started at check-in at International Airport and worked my way through um, into IT. So I'd been in IT for the last nine and a half years, uh, at working on multiple um, technology projects across Qantas Group in the operational space. Um, on that journey, I discovered um, that on our reconciliation plan um, report, um, I was the only Indigenous person that was in IT for the last nine years at Qantas. So it was a bit of a, a light bulb moment. Um, at that same time on the journey, uh, back then, it was definitely, you know, a lot of men were in IT. <laughs> That's how I looked at it. And I was like, I was really calling out for support, not in a bad way, but like surrounding myself with the right people and trying to find that pathway and guidance to getting uh, skilled and continue that training in IT because I loved it. Um, that led me to University of Technology Sydney at the same time. And this is 2016 now. So we uh, hadn't picked up a pen in 20 odd years, how to, to do an assignment literally. <laughs> and I got into the elite master's um, IT master's uh, post-grad. So I was the first Indigenous in 2016. So I had the two with Qantas and uh, UTS. And so, uh, yeah, in 2019, sort of uh, thought, okay, discovering that there's not, there was no support on my journey in the IT space, um, Indigenous technology was founded from this experience. So I lived and breathed it trying to create a pathway, couldn't find an Indigenous uh, IT company on this journey uh, to help mob or Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, so, yeah, so um, I have started the, I started Indigenous technology as a startup to provide uh, technology solutions for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people uh, across the country. So pretty much wanting to run the business using my experience uh, in project management technical BA business analyst and a product analyst to give back to community. Um, and there was a clear gap in the community that they needed an IT, Indigenous owned IT company. Um, from there, um, yeah, I launched the business at Parliament House um, with Supply Nation. So I was still at Qantas at the time. Um, the strategic uh, vision for the business was because I had my, one of the story journeys is um, I migrated 3,000 devices from XP to Windows 7 and I got the, this annual award from Alan Joyce, the CEO of Qantas, for the top 100 employees. And that was one of the alarm bells going, OK, we've gone to something here and there's an opportunity to um, use those skills but to create the business and it was launched in Parliament House. Um, so from there, um, we've, I've moved really quickly, rapidly, as I'm probably going to say, um, for me to be now reaching Canada, <laughs> um, uh, set up into four pillars of the business. We have uh, technology partners, um, technology partners in uh, with the capabilities of not crossing over to the vision that I wanted to do for the next five, ten years with Indigenous technology, uh, have Microsoft, IBM, uh, Verizon. Uh, for 5G cyber security, uh, modern workplace for Microsoft, IBM for infrastructure, Fujitsu with hardware, uh, Apple, uh, KPMG and Ernst & Young, uh, and then our Indigenous partners, and also education and training. So you can clearly see the business is 100% Indigenous owned. Um, I run it, make all the decisions, lead the business, and it's, yeah, it's just gone. I don't even know what I can say on this, but yeah, if I keep going, it'll just you'll just be shocked. But <laughs> it's just the 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 part the the um the clients are working with federal and state government in Australia, um, and then our large corporates and those corporates that are involved uh, or part of Indigenous Technologies Network have a reconciliation action plan, so they are aligned to us and our values. So yeah, 
I could keep going on, but I'm not going to keep going on. But you know. so yeah. <laughs> no, thank you, Cheryl. I there's just so many things that resonated with me. Like there's such power in having women in circle together. Um, yeah. And I know that's not the truth only for Indigenous women, but women in general. Yeah. So that's why yeah. events like this are are so amazing. And um, yeah. I also think as women, we don't um, talk about our successes enough. I, yeah. I think that. Um, yeah. men broadly speaking are very good at that and we need to celebrate so um, thank you for sharing your story thanks Raylene thank you next we have Jen Harper um, from Cheekbone Beauty Jen please hi tell her, good tell evening her mission a bit about yourself I Ani uh, Jen Harper Dijna Cause I am the founder and CEO of Cheekbone Beauty Cosmetics we're headquartered and I live on the land of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe people, and I am an Anishinaabe woman from the other side of Ontario, which is closer to uh, the Manitoba border. Um, and I started this business with literally, <laughs> I laugh and have to chuckle because I, I, I think I'm feeling like Cheryl when you're like, you can't believe what you've built or created. Um, mm. But that's, that's the power I think about being an Indigenous woman. But so in my basement, literally five years ago last week, I started Cheap Bone Beauty with the idea of literally just creating a brand that represented Indigenous faces, because that has never been seen in the beauty industry ever around the world, which in, you know, 2016, is it still blows my mind that that didn't exist. Um, but it didn't. And, and not on a global scale and neither on a permanent campaign. We see lots of brands that are not Indigenous that will offer campaigns to us and our beauty and the way we look and feel. Um, I, I should say the way we look, because they can never understand the way we feel, the way an Indigenous person would, being the leader and founder of the Indigenous beauty brand. Um, and so that was five years ago. This year, we launched in Sephora, Canada, which is Sephora is the world's leading beauty retailer um, and just began that relationship with them. And it's been, that sounds like a really fast spot, like basement to Sephora. I can assure you that those five years have been this massive roller coaster of up and down things, but those up things are only because of the incredible people within so many circles and communities of other Indigenous folks that I've been able to surround myself with that have uplifted and helped us build the brand. And really, we are coming into the beauty industry not to be the best Indigenous beauty brand in the world, but we're actually coming to have a reckoning with the beauty space. The, the, mm. the, the entire industry, when I got here, not having any experience, I came from the food world. I discovered that so, like so many things needed to change. And, and that came to the, that idea I'm quoting sustainability because it's so overly greenwashed and used <laughs> at the moment. Um, but as a brand, it's literally what we live and breathe and try to do from the idea of how how every ingredient is harvested. Um, this industry did not love sharing information. We've broken and made sure we have zero ties with any supply chain that will not divulge where and how things are done. So for us, we use a concept called life cycle thinking from the beginning of the harvesting of a product to the end of the life of a product. Um, our goal is not to have anything end up in a landfill. And so we've literally reimagined what packaging will look mm. like. Um, and so every product that we have created, um, there's no silver bullet either. Sustainability is a journey. There's no end point. But what we have behind us is this thousands of years who I call Indigenous people, the OGs of sustainability. So it blows my mind too that the entire world is sitting here right now going, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? And 80% of this world's biodiversity is protected by Indigenous people. It has been happening that way for a very long time. Um, and, it, it, you know, we have answers to support 
and create some solutions, you know, we're going to have to explain to a lot of people that having the most money in the world isn't the answer and, and reframe how people think and feel about those things. But that is a cultural perspective that needs to be trained. And the idea of contentment and harmony and being in balance with nature versus uh, things in nature being commodities is, is a view that really has to shift. But we're just a small little brand here in Canada that wants to grow globally and, and be sure that every our mission and vision from the day we started was helping every Indigenous kid on the planet see and feel their value in the world. Well, we're crafting sustainable color cosmetics. I'm so excited that uh, my community and communities around the world have supported that. And I got to be on a call yesterday with some incredible Indigenous women that have been supporting this from the beginning. And one of them said, literally, with this new campaign that we have going live called Write the Story, said they had no idea that they needed cheekbone beauty. And they're like, I know you you promote empowering Indigenous youth, but I'm an Indigenous woman in my 40s, and I never knew I needed a beauty brand the way you've made me feel like I need a beauty brand. So thank you. Excellent. I feel like I want to get up and start jumping on my couch. I'm just so excited and so I feel so grateful to have you all on the call today. Jen, your story is amazing. And I don't think that it is going to be the only one. I think that there's this resurgence of Indigenous, specifically women entrepreneurs around the world, that we're going to keep making changes and keep pushing the envelope forward. So mm -hmm. thank you for inspiring us. Last but not least, we have Kiri Nathan. Kiri, it's such a pleasure to have you on the call. Can you tell us about your your business and your journey with learning your traditional language? Yeah, sure. Kia ora koutou. Ko hiki rangi rātou, ko moi hā, ko maunga tau tare, ko ki maunga, ko te rere e tere, ko waihau, ko pi ako, ko ia awa. Ko ti kapa tōku moana, ko mā tātua rawa, ko tainui o ku waka. Ko nā pue rātou, ko nā te hine, ko nā te maru, Ko nga te haua o ku iwi, ko kiri Nathan tō ku ingoa. Bonsoir, bonjour, um, hello to Australia. <laughs> it's so lovely to be on this panel with you three um, incredible wahine, and I feel quite privileged that I got to hear all your stories straight from your beautiful Indigenous hearts this morning before I um, go into mine. Oh, sorry, wrong time zones, right? Um I'm the founder of Kitty Nathan Limited, which is a, a indigenous fashion brand. And we started in 2010. We create uh, kakahu clothing, uh, hand-woven uh, contemporary uh, accessories based on traditional processes and techniques and ponamu jewelry, which is what I'm wearing here. This stone is only found in the South Island of Aotearoa. It's, um, it's a taonga or very special special, special stone to us. And I also founded Kahui Collective, which is, I guess it is the birth of a community that um, that is supporting all Māori and Indigenous fashion designers. Uh, and we're starting small here. And the reason for it was that um, we went through a lot of challenge during our 10 years of, of creating our business. And we just didn't want every other Māori and Indigenous designer that was coming through to have to go through the same struggles that we did. So when we started in 2011, um, there was no brand. There was no Māori brands. Uh, there had never been a Māori brand or fashion brand that had sat in the high end of fashion. And so we had closed doors everywhere we went. We were excluded from the uh, fashion industry 100%. And so we had to find different ways, you know, to, to reach our markets and, and gain some kind of commerce. Nobody would stock us. Uh, and so we became the hour. We became the river. And we went mm -hmm. over and under and around. And we found different ways of doing things. But we always led with um, our Indigenous knowledge and we always led with authenticity in our relationships, which is what Indigenous people do. And so because of that, 10 years later or 11 years later, we are now the only New Zealand um, fashion label to have met with world leaders like, and, and they own our products now, like Barack Obama, Beyonce. Um, we're the only or we're the first New Zealand fashion brand to ever work with Walt Disney Studios. We are the first New Zealand fashion brand to be invited by the Queen of Thailand 
for the um, celebration of silk. Our pieces are owned by museums all over the world and um, we're now miraculously fully invited to all of the mainstream fashion industry, everything, <laughs> and all over the world because of one thing, our superpower, our indigeneity, and we never let go of it. When people were telling us that we had nothing, they laughed at us. Mm -hmm. um, they went out of their way to ensure that we wouldn't be successful. All of those same people now are literally trying to do what we've done for the last 11 years, which is lead with Indigenous knowledge, with sustainable and ethical thinking. And yes, those words are so annoying because our ancestors have been using them in our own languages for thousands of years. Hey, we carry on. Hari um, And I think, um, you know, for the platform and the people that, we're, that, are, that are in this call or listening to this panel today, it's just so important to, when the world is still trying to learn the lessons of our ancestors. It's just so important that we hold on and understand our superpower, mm -hmm. and that is being Indigenous Wahine. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, that's a little bit about our business. There's lots more, like like the other Wahine on this panel said, you could go on for hours talking about the different kinds of challenges um, and racism, mm -hmm. and you know, um, trying to work within colonized frameworks and structures and the frustration of all of that. And so we've really just tried to <clears throat> completely build our own um, playing fields. So we went 100% online because nobody would stock us and therefore people all around the world found us and um, all these beautiful uh, global relationships were, were uh, blossomed, hepo away. And... Um, <clears throat> We, I suppose, have always led with the integrity was the most important thing. Our cultural integrity and our cultural in intelligence was always the most important thing. The bottom line and the money was a, you know, a roll-on effect of the things that were really important to us, our value sets. And because of that, we have loyal, loyal followings. And I really believe a game that is an indigenous superpower that um, the rest of the world is still trying to catch up with. Mm -hmm. For inviting us in, Raylene, for monitoring today, and to my beautiful sisters on this panel. Thank you, Kerry. So we only have 20 minutes left on this panel. Um, I'm very keen to, to ask some audience inspired questions. So um, hopefully it's okay with the Asia Pacific Foundation. I'm gonna veer off the agenda a little bit and just ask some collective questions to, to everybody on this panel. I think my first question is, you know, at least in Canada, we hear a lot about what indigenous people and communities are missing, right? It's a deficiency narrative, but what do indigenous entrepreneurs bring to the conversation? What do, like, if you had to boil it down to one or two things, what do we have to offer um, that perhaps some time ago wasn't, wasn't well understood? Um, maybe Caroline, I'll start with you if that's okay. Yeah, for sure. I think Indigenous entrepreneurs bring a different mindset and perspective around value creation. That value creation in itself isn't connected to only revenue generation, that it's connected to resilience, continuation, responsibility, ties to community, representation of who we are. And I think it's a platform that expresses really who we are and uh, who we are is reflected in our business models. And although even on here of just how all of these different business approaches, it all speaks to what we value, who we value, and how we express value creation in that. Thank you. Amazing. Maybe Cheryl or let's, let's freestyle ladies. Just add you yeah. to <laughs> Uh, look, uh, I think on this journey, it definitely has been resilience because I look back to 
prior to, I suppose, you know, the childhood coming up to now running this business and high demand and its waves of ups and downs are uh, resilience and you just get knocked down and you get back up again. Oh, my God, it's full on. It's like, yes, you have all these highs and all these lows, but you're still going, you're still strong. Okay, we, you know, yes, we had that, well, you know, my journey, yes, it was tough. Um, and I think having that earlier hard life has made me, um, you know, run this company because of that experience and you know all of those setbacks that keeps you keeps you going keeps you driving and then you want to inspire others so um yeah amazing thank you cheryl my answer was going to be very similar that i believe that it's this resilience this grit mm -hmm. that um i really see within our communities around the world and it's that overcoming those climbing mountains, those obstacles, and not letting those things get in our way. My mm -hmm. personal journey, again, a, a, a tri childhood trauma, which is, you know, stems from that generational trauma that we all know about. Um, and then my own battle with alcoholism, but overcoming that. And for a long time, I believed what society was telling me about the type of Indigenous person that I was. Mm -hmm. And when I stopped believing what they were saying about me, and I got well and I healed and I overcame that mountain like obstacle of alcoholism. Building a company was just like, yeah, let's get at it. Let's do it because yeah. anything's possible. In my mind, I've said before, anyone who knows anyone in recovery or sobriety, I felt like a rock star that first year. And that's when I started Cheekbone Beauty. And um, it's really been part of that healing journey, but really seeing what resilience and grit can do. Um, and that's what entrepreneurship is. It's just that constant being knocked down and popping back up again. <laughs> Yeah, I think there's something really powerful in building an Indigenous um, support system around you. Uh, so mm. I, my tribe, that's my chosen tribe, and that is a group of wahine that I go to when I am sitting on a board and having racist remarks made to me, um, mm. walking into a room where I'm the only Māori, and that just happens all the time, um, mm. being asked for cultural favours because I'm the only Māori in the room, and therefore represent the entire race and know everything you know mm. it's just these ongoing sort of challenges that we all face and also all of us all of us have suffered generational colonization and mm. all of us carry a deep set of mummy or pain because of that and so there's something about going out into the world and being unapologetically in my case maori mm. and not only being confident in that, but also sticking up for it. So we've taken some of the largest companies in New Zealand to like, like legal action against them for appropriation and misappropriation and won. We've had policy change occur because of, you know, just being brave enough to stand up for who we are because we've been raised in a society that oppresses us. Yeah. And so being able to um, walk forward without fear mm. that, Power and I just wish that for every Indigenous wahine, every Indigenous rangatahi or youth in the world. Yeah. Oh, and men, they can, they can, they can do it too. <laughs> no, I, I love that. Thank you. It's um, it's a really test. It's a massive testament to to Indigenous people and especially women, um, because at least in in this country, you know, we are the most marginalized population. And so um, to have these amazing entrepreneurs, you know, here today and, and around us, inspiring the next generations, I'm just really excited to see what, you know, when I'm a grandmother, great grandmother for future generations, what the world looks like. Um, so my next question is around, um, because this is an international trade mission, why is it important for indigenous entrepreneurs and especially women to look internationally and to to trade to engage to build relationships i'm curious to see what value um, yourself see in that um do you want me to go first <laughs> um I, from the uh again like i'm at the startup stage but having uh, the international partners on board. Uh, yes, it was to align obviously with Australia, but 
the, the international uh, trade, uh, having the partners is looking to seeing what they're also developing in the tech space and bringing those opportunities and ideas back to community, back to uh, remote areas that I can get access to out in the outback where I could bring technology that would help better their lives. And I think that's what I would like to do is uh, leveraging with our international partners. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, that's sort of my main, my main one at the moment. Mm. So going international to help back at home and yeah, yeah, so, yeah, check what they see what the partners are doing at an international level in the tech, tech uh, design space, um, in their innovation hubs and bringing those ideas and opportunities back to Australia. I have that uh, opportunity where I can work with the partners uh, in their innovation hubs and. If it's got to be somebody, it's got to be you know, an Indigenous woman going over to get the idea and seeing how that could work and making our life easier or better for community because um, there is a lot that needs to be done in this space. Uh, you know, we've got black spots in the, uh, in, you know, in the outback. How do we get connectivity uh, in the outback? How do we make their life easier? Uh, we've got health. You've got uh, study uh, students having to fly few hours to go to the nearest high school um, and board. So there's a, yeah, we're trying to make life easier. So wanting to see what's out there uh, coming in the future and hopefully bringing, bringing something that will make it uh, easier uh, in, yeah, for mob across the country while I'm working with Australian businesses and federal and state government to make, uh, uh, create innovative ideas, but also bringing that youth, um, on that journey as well. Um, yeah, so yeah, I could go on, but <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Cheryl. No worries. Maybe Carol Ann, uh, the Global sure. Center of Indigenomics. You obviously some see some value operating on the international stage. Yeah, absolutely. I think trade has to be a primary lever in that. It needs to be about uh, visibility of Indigenous business. It needs to be about the space for Indigenous business, the structural response. It needs to be about Indigenous-led space and representation. So while we're starting to see early uh, signals around larger political structures for inclusion of trade. I think on the ground, the evolution and scale of products, um, whether it's fashion, um, within so many kind of what we would say is non-traditional industries or sectors, product development is happening at rapid pace and from Indigenous perspectives that are actively overcoming barriers and challenges, much as what we've heard on this call today. So it's in those processes for visibility, for the creation of space in whether that's virtual or in real person, real time, uh, representation of Indigenous peoples within trade networks and structures to build um, a trade response at a global level. We're here, we're looking at it, and I think to see um, the response of increasing um, waves of Indigenous people creating business as a response to now it's absolutely powerful to witness and to watch that express itself within trade itself. I think we'll be watching what this looks like in even 10 years and we'll go back and be like, remember when? <laughs> Thank you. Amazing. Jen or Kiri, go ahead, Kiri. Um, we, built, um, we built opportunities for ourselves uh, for our businesses that were and are currently country and world firsts. So the first thing that was really important to us was that we put the ladder down and we supported um, emerging Māori and Indigenous creatives into opportunities and into growth because there has to be that depth, you know. We have to be constantly thinking about our responsibility to everyone that's coming through so that they don't have to go through all of the challenges that we did and they just get a faster mm. and better start. And so we're currently um, collaborating with a Indigenous female social enterprise in Indonesia where we're working with um, waste product and dead stock and we're creating accessories, fashion accessories, and we're combining 
our our indigenous cultures and creating pattern and story through the pieces so these kinds of relationships are just they're lifelong and they're so important um, but every opportunity that we create it's our responsibility to make sure that we're helping others into that and that we're sharing all the knowledge we're sharing all of the the data we're sharing the relationships so part of Kahui Collective, which is the um, fashion community that we've founded, and that's like a fashion movement, we have shared everything that we've learned. Um, we've shared every um, every relationship, every network, every contractor. We've made a directory where everyone can source, you know, so much. It's so hard to find things in New Zealand in our industry, and so they don't have to worry about that now. And so I think if you're leading in the world, authentically you are authentically sharing everything all the time and that's how i see relationships really blooming collaborations really working authentically and um effectively and yeah it's exciting you know it's exciting because like i said earlier the world's shifting and they're starting to you know <laughs> sort of realize this this information and this knowledge that we've had for centuries that we need to protect and we need to encourage and we need to lead with kindness and and um, just help everyone onto the waka. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Kerry. There definitely is power in a, a global collective, isn't there? So that's that's one of the reasons why Indigenous people and especially Indigenous women should be operating on a global level. Jen, uh, you started your business and it's mushroomed uh, so quickly what do you think about operating on a global scale why is it important for indigenous women yeah again if, i think it goes back to that visibility representation um so many um you know experts in the, this industry from the beginning they don't see the need for an indigenous beauty brand um and i think it's because in each they operate in the those silos of each country or each territory um and so they're only looking at who's available to them when we're you know as a business we're looking at this we were looking at this globally from the beginning not just where we're going to sell in canada and what's really really interesting is the time period that we're living in history our consumer so that there's a lot of misconceptions around indigenous business uh specifically that our customer would only be indigenous people we have like a 75 percent non-indigenous consumer base uh who's in our community and these are incredible human beings that are here to uplift and really be uh, are truly allies to support indigenous uh, businesses that operate within their their uh, parts of the world, and so we're really lucky that that's who we have. And so that idea right now, I feel like I'm just uh, as the as the founder at Chiefone because they said you know people don't think there's a need for that i'm like let's just blaze a trail and show them yeah you were kind of wrong about that the, the our businesses can be global um and and there's really good reason for that because of the insights that we bring to the projects and the innovation that we're working on to show one specifically in, in our case in the beauty space Amazing. Yeah, just filling entrepreneurship, filling the gaps that exist and, you know, noticing on the international scale um, that those gaps exist in other countries as well. Thanks, Jen. So we have uh, less than five minutes. Um, these panels always go so quickly. So I'm going to ask one last question. This is an audience question. Um, and I want to make it applicable to, to everybody that's joining us, whether they're Indigenous or not. You know, we're we're busy. We're we're mothers. We're partners. We're community members. We're entrepreneurs. We're uh, sometimes the cleaners and the grocery shoppers. How how do you not lose yourself um, in building these massively <laughs> successful businesses? How do you rebalance? I can start. I <laughs> could definitely talk to that. Um, my. I've had to, obviously, you need a routine. Uh, exercise and mental health is definitely part of this um, and getting sleep, going to sleep early. So um, I, I'm probably doing a 16-hour day uh, from, yeah, 5 a.m. I'm at F45. Then I've got two dogs, um, give them love, and then my day starts. 
um, and then literally in bed uh, early before nine o'clock every day. But I am doing seven days a week and the only way to get through this is to have the fitness, the mental health um, and meditation um, and obviously, yeah, not having any disruptions to um, when you've got, because as you know, running a business, you have a new thing that pops up every day, every hour and you're going, okay, I've got to be ready for that. So yeah, I think that's sort of what gets me through to manage what um, uh, my, you know, pretty much you have to, you're the engine, you have to keep it running, you have to be fit. Um, yeah. So. Amazing. Caroline? Yeah, I think it would be similar. I'm very disciplined in the conversations that I have. I have no time for nonsense. Um, just yeah. being around people that are focused, that are generative, that are really um, believing in our resilience and on the solution side of that resilience is really important to me. Um, when I run, I run, I train. I actually am there so that when I'm stuck, my first thought is I trained for this. So my physical body is reflective of my ability to have a mental state to create success in that situation. Mm -hmm. I think the other is just managing my energy and really being aware of it and taking responsibility for it and just how much external externalities there are of what I'm paying attention to. Um, sometimes that's really being able to um, have the mental discipline. I try to be able to manage my response to difficulties and challenges. So I learned in my own indigenous language, it's easy in French and Spanish and English, and just be able to build my response. This is easy. I know how to do this. And mm -hmm. the knowing is bigger than me. The knowing is coming from ancestral strength and courage. And that's where that my response to the challenges is it's easy because of who we are and that's what keeps me going thank you amazing we have about a minute left any well quick i've got like five kids and three grandchildren so uh the juggle is real <laughs> <laughs> the word balance is elusive to me i have no idea what that is um, but I, like I mentioned earlier, um, having a chosen tribe to surround yourself with. Um, mm -hmm. I also have like what I call an inertia field where I keep out all the people that, you know, kind of like, um, what do you call them? Emotional vampires and uh, racists and, you know, all these types of people. We keep them on the outside of the inertia field and the chosen tribe very, very close. Um, I've learned to try and be kind to myself because um, I like to try and get far too much done uh, with not enough hours in the day. I like Cheryl. I live on around about four to five hours sleep and um, that's not good. I, I, unlike Cheryl, don't go for runs. So <laughs> that's not good either. But um, yeah, uh, I often do karakia prayer um, and I just, I'm, I'm okay every now and then just to say, you know what, you just need to stop for a little while. Yeah. Around yourself with love and so yeah. yeah yeah and i'm literally will echo all of the things they said it's a circle for me four quadrants spiritually emotionally mentally and physically every single day can i check those boxes it's not mm. always perfect but i try good on you yeah jen i think you forgot we need lipstick too <laughs> yeah. and lipstick it will make you feel better <laughs> the saying here in Canada that um, the strong indigenous woman across all fields say so put on your cheekbone beauty lipstick and deal with it <laughs> yes <laughs> amazing well thank you so much ladies um, I want to express gratitude on the behalf of the audience thank you for your leadership thank you for your your insight and thank you for joining us and imparting your wisdom on us today. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, absolutely inspiring. Thank you, Raleen and panelists for sharing your incredible stories. I'm just amazed. I'm looking at this right now. I just heard Kiri say she had five kids 
and grandkids and still she goes at the speed that she does just amazing powerful women uh we wish you continued success moving forward in all of your activities your endeavors and your businesses so now we're going to take a brief health break for five minutes when you return we'll go straight into the delegates pitches so please return on time please choose the breakout room you wish to attend based on the sectors of your interest. Breakout one will be hosted by Lo uh, Dr. Lois Nahirni and focuses on software products, so the software sector. Breakout two will be hosted by Lisa DeWild and will uh, focus uh, on uh, manufacturing sector. And breakout three will be hosted by me, uh, showcasing companies that provide professional services. After the pitches, Delegates will participate in a moderated Q&A with the guests, so the guests are free to ask questions and please pump those questions into the chat. So with no further ado, quick five minute break, please. Thank you. Welcome, Welcome back, back everybody. everybody. I hope, I hope the, the pitches, pitches were informative, informative and, will and will encourage some, some of our Australian, Australian and New Zealand businesses, businesses online, online tonight, tonight to follow, to follow, follow up, up with B2B meetings, meetings, meetings with our delegates. Check, Check the chat, the chat line, line for contact information of our agents in Australia, Australia and New Zealand. Zealand. If, you if you wish to make arrangements for a B2B meeting, meeting or one-on-one one 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 with any of our companies or representatives who participated tonight. For New Zealand businesses, please contact Tanya Tay-Fenwa or Aisha Goa at, at uh, uh, ca.nz ca trade at gmail.com. For Australian, Australian businesses, businesses, please contact, contact Doris Dunham, Dunham of Smart Mango or Christelle Kinsella. And, and you'll, you'll see, see their, their emails, emails will pop up very, very shortly. shortly. Before, Before we conclude, conclude, I would like, I would to, like take to take this opportunity to once, once again, again thank the government, the government of Canada, Canada for their for generous, generous contributions, contributions to the to Canadian a women's a a business, business mission, mission series. series. Um, um, our presenting sponsor, sponsor Air Canada, Canada to our to partner, partner CEO under, under the leadership of Vicky Saunders, Saunders and our and supporting, supporting our organization, organization in DGX, DGX under, under the Swayman Whitford leadership. leadership. Our, our sincerest appreciation, appreciation for working with us on this exciting, exciting and groundbreaking women only business mission to Australia and New Zealand. And, and many, many, many thanks, thanks to our inspiring, inspiring speakers, speakers over, over the last, last two days, days panelists, panelists and, delegates, and delegates, and our engaging, engaging audience, audience, without, without whom there wouldn't, there wouldn't have been a reason, reason to meet me for the last, the last two days. days. I have I my have fingers, fingers crossed that, that we will see many, many feats, feats of our collaborative efforts, efforts in the form, in the form of, of new business deals, deals partnerships, and collaborations for our delegates, which would be mutually beneficial for all three economies. I would, I would also, also like to like close with a huge shout out to our, to our talented, talented and hardworking team at the Asia Pacific, Pacific Foundation of Canada, Canada who, made who made this mission, mission happen. happen. A, a big, big applause, applause please, please for, for our, our team. team. Good night, good, night. good day. day, merci, merci. Thank, thank you, Tina Poto, Katoa. Good night. Good night.